I'm Adam and this is Real Rivalries, the show where we pit two movies head to head and let you decide the winner. This week, a couple of monumental films in the MCU do battle as Avengers Infinity War goes up against Avengers Endgame. The categories in play are characters, story, visual effects, and action. Enough talk though, let's snap to it. That was a poor choice of words. I see that now. These films each have roughly a budget of $320 million. And after Robert Downey Jr. gets his cut, there's still a little bit left over for the effects. It's absolutely astonishing how much of these flicks are shot in front of a green screen. What's more impressive are the amount of times I was actually convinced the actor was on location. Captain America fighting with himself on a glass walkway seemed like something that was possible to go shoot at, uh, but no, the whole thing was built on a computer. Chris Evans played both versions of the character when possible. When both were on camera at once, they would replace the body double's face with Evans. The most impressive technical achievement for most viewers would be Thanos. Motion capture taken from Josh Brolin was brought to life by hundreds of digital animators and dozens of studios. Infinity War had a really great fight scene between a ragtag group of heroes and Thanos on planet Titan. Weta Digital handled the effect sequence here, which is really a stunning achievement to see play out. Smart Hulk makes his big screen debut in Endgame, which blends Mark Ruffalo with his gamma-fueled counterpart. It's an interesting concept, and I think it was mostly achieved on screen. There is a certain level of uncanny valley, though, that can spring up from time to time, with not just Hulk, but also the human characters as well. This tends to happen when they're in a CGI suit, occasionally having that floating head vibe going on. That said, the movie has also convinced me they were in suits when in fact they were 100% CGI. Those cool white time suits, for instance, were added in post, which honestly makes me question what is real in this world anymore. Big Lebowski Thor wore an actual fat suit that fit around Chris Hemsworth. It was very believable and slightly on the comical side. Listen, I'm not saying Chris Hemsworth isn't dedicated to the role of Thor, but Christian Bale would have put that weight on himself, then dropped it in two weeks for another film role, then put it back on just for sport. We could spend hours pouring over all the skill and talent on display when it comes to the effects work in these pictures, but that's not the point of this show. I think out of the thousands of effects shots on display, only a couple really stick out as needing some extra polish. Between the number of planets visited, the armies generated, and the aging effects crafted, it's hard to nitpick too much. It's also hard to say which movie outdoes the other in this department. I'm gonna throw out the tie card. I think that's fair. I think it's more than fair. There were 18 movies in the Marvel Cinematic Universe before Infinity War hit the big screen. So going in, a large portion of the audience knows these characters well. Unless you're my buddy Zack, in which case you scrambled to watch a bunch of recap videos one hour before the film started. You're a poser, Zack! And everybody knows it! Sorry, stay focused, Adam. An overwhelming amount of the previous MCU lineup is on display here, and almost every character gets one or two moments to shine. The tension between Tony Stark and Steve Rogers is set aside for the greater good. Thor gets to have a heart-to-heart -heart with a garbage panda over past loss. T'Challa opens Wakanda up to try saving Vision. Then there's our boy Star-Lord, really dropping the ball in the final play of the game. I get it, Quill. Gamora was worth it. Now watch me work it. As much as this film is about the Avengers, it's equally about the villain, Thanos. A large purple alien whose thoughts on balancing the universe are suspect at best. Perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Wanting to kill off half the population to save the universe is a bold move, Cotton. Well, we'll see how it plays out. The fact that some of the viewers were ride or die with Thanos' viewpoint kinda worries me a little, kinda kinda troubles me, but I'll move past it. Josh Brolin gives us easily one of the best villain performances in the MCU, and it's a shame he was put on the back burner in Endgame. Granted, his story was told in Infinity War, and now it was our hero's turn to fight back. The cast is all there for the conclusion, including a few that were previously missing in action. Jeremy Renner's Hawkeye, now brandishing a sword and a stylish new haircut, gets back into the fold, along with Paul Rudd's Ant-Man. Then there's the newest member, Captain Marvel, played by Brie Larson, who flies in and out of the picture when it's convenient for the script. I think the only thing really missing in the sequel is Captain America's glorious beard, a character I was really growing quite fond of. It's tough to part ways, but alas, all good things must come to an end, I suppose. 
Speaking of OG Avengers, Hulk and Thor went through a pretty dramatic metamorphosis of sorts. The son of Odin is at his lowest point. Out of shape, no prospects, playing Fortnite with his bros while the world mourns. It's my friend Zack all over again. The Hulk is now 50 shades of gray, smart, and a permanent fixture of Banner. Apparently, they came to an agreement off camera and decided to fuse as one. What? I, I see this as an absolute win. A lot of people were excited to see Hulk get revenge on Thanos after taking a pretty vicious beating in Infinity War. So it was a big letdown to see this arc handled off screen. Granted, it's a small gripe considering what we get in the final battle. If I had to pick a winner in this category, which I absolutely do, as these are the rules I have burdened myself with, then I guess I would lean Infinity War. It's entirely for Captain America's beard. Avengers Infinity War took a lot of people by surprise. Even those familiar with the comic counterpart weren't entirely convinced Disney and Marvel would go for it with the Thanos storyline, meaning wipe out half the universe's population. The Russo brothers, who directed both parts, set up a huge story with an insanely great payoff. Infinity War brings the pain as Thanos traverses worlds with his minions to seek out the six Infinity Stones. Individually, each stone has a specific power that, when controlled, can give the owner immense abilities. Thanos isn't content with one stone, though. He's got much loftier aspirations. By harnessing the power of all six together, he can destroy worlds. His intentions are more nuanced than your typical supervillain. Thanos believes that in order to save the universe, he needs to wipe out half the inhabitants to bring back balance. The storyline has been hinted at and built up for over a decade now with some of the Infinity Stones playing crucial roles in previous films, such as the Tesseract in Captain America or the Soul Stone in that Thor sequel that no one remembers. The first half of Infinity War is like a giant crazy Easter egg hunt, except instead of our Avengers getting chocolates, they get dead. They get dead? Who is writing this? Tony Stark becomes aware this may be a problem when Hulk crash lands back down to Earth and shortly after him, aliens stop by. Doctor Strange, Peter Parker, and Team Money, which is what I'm calling Tony Stark for this one time only, jump on a ship and eventually meet up with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Meanwhile, Thor and Rocket head to a dying star to forge a new weapon to kill a mad titan. I'm not honestly clear if Thanos is a titan or half a titan, maybe titan light. Uh, tight and clear. I don't know. I I've read somewhere that he's an eternal. No idea what that means. Let's just move on. While all this is going down, Timber, Wakanda is gearing up for a battle against a large race of alien fodder while they attempt to remove the Mind Stone from Vision's head. There's a crazy amount of story jam-packed into this film. Red Skull is like the gatekeeper of the Soul Stone. Doctor Strange goes on a mind bender through all the different future timelines. Groot rips off his own arm, and uses a battle axe handle. And I feel like I'm missing one key thing that happens in this film. Oh yes, Thanos wipes out half of the universe's population. All because Thor has bad aim. It's really what it all comes down to. You should have gone for the head. Watching the hero slowly turn to ash was a brutal moment to see unfold, especially when Parker mentions to Stark that he's not feeling so good. The movie ends with the Avengers emotionally drained, stranded on different ends of the world, all while Thanos enjoys a nice sunset on his alien farm, having achieved his goal. A bold, hard-hitting ending that fans would have to wait for one more year to see concluded, and what an ending it would be. Endgame opens things up in space, where we see a very disheveled Tony Stark recording a farewell message to Pepper Potts. Pepper Potts. What a, what a name. What a good name. It's right up there with Peppa Pig. They're, they're interchangeable. He and Nebula have been adrift for a few weeks now with no prospects of flying back home. That is, until Carol Danvers, aka Captain Marvel, just conveniently flies upon him. How she managed to find them in the vast reaches of space is anyone's guess, including the script, as it doesn't even entertain a reason. The Avengers head back to Earth where things are looking just as grim. The remaining team decides to saddle up for one last ride to kill Thanos, who I think has made a nice quaint life for himself there on the ranch, presumably growing his own crops, herding his own sheep, and drinking his own blue milk from an alien cow. Unfortunately, Thanos reveals that he had in fact destroyed the stones with the stones. He put the stones in a hole and threw away the hole. The picture then jumps forward five years in time to reveal the real hero of the picture, a rat. This little scamp fires up Ant-Man's flux capacitor and he reappears from the quantum realm unbeknownst to the events that had taken place. Earth is a shell of its former self, much like me after marriage. 
People are depressed, and even the Avengers are barely keeping it together. Captain Marvel had to leave because of volcanoes or something. Uh, Black Widow can't finish a sandwich without crying into it. And the biggest tragedy of all, Captain America parted with a real hero, a true friend, the beard. It's gone. Ant-Man, or Scott Lang if you must, I don't know why you must, but it's there, the option's there. Give the Avengers one sliver of hope when all was previously lost. He proposes time travel so that they can correct the horrible damage Thanos has delivered. Tony, now a proud husband and father, decides to go along with this radical idea, and within the span of a cup of coffee, he figures out the immense complications of time travel. This brings us to a large chunk of the picture. Time heist. The Avengers Ocean's Eleven this thing, splitting up into different groups so they can steal the Infinity Stones and snap themselves back to reality. Well, there goes gravity. <laughs> I had to. These events lead to some very fun callbacks to previous films, along with some really great cameos from the MCU roster. Past Thanos finds out what's going on, and eventually all this leads to the showdown of the century. The last 45 minutes is pure cinematic gold, with good and evil clashing together in epic fashion. Infinity War punished our heroes time and time again, and now we get to see them fight back at full strength. We get really awesome moments, such as Steve Rogers wielding Thor's hammer. I will not try to pronounce it because it will just come out ignorant and almost every hero gets one or two scenes to shine. Then there's the incredibly emotional On Your Left shout out, where Black Panther and company assemble by Captain America's side. Assemble. The death of Tony Stark was handled perfectly too, resulting in theaters packed with sobbing viewers. While Endgame definitely delivers on the confrontation teased over the years, the pacing is very inconsistent. The time heist feels a bit stretched, and the film doesn't move with the same intensity that Infinity War does. That's why I'm giving this round, brace yourselves, to part one. It is very possible to make a great comic book movie without a lot of the action and pomp and thrills. The Joker proved that for many people. The Avengers films, however, are not that type of vehicle. We expect explosions, crazy superpowers, and devastating destruction. Infinity War and Endgame are packed to the brim with all of the above. The opening sequence in part one is brutal and easily one of the darkest moments in the MCU. Watching Thanos and his henchmen make short use of Thor's people and his half-brother Loki instantly gets the audience fired up with rage. Then to watch Hulk get absolutely owned and cower away further showcases what a huge threat Thanos is. The battle outside Sanctum Sanctorum is fast and visceral. Spider-Man, Iron Man, Doctor Strange, and Banner take on aliens in a much more daunting fashion. I previously mentioned the fight on Titan. I did, however, fail to mention Thanos throws a freaking moon at Tony Stark. I'm in awe of how far technology has come in just the last decade. It's truly awesome stuff. There is a cool fan service fight between some of the Guardians and the Avengers, and then of course there's also the final battle in Wakanda. It's unfortunate that there's a little bit of redundancy here, as Black Panther was the previous movie, so we were already fighting in this neck of the woods. But then Thor, Rocket, and Groot smash down and totally redeem the scene. This is my personal favorite moment between both of these parts. Although I am still unclear as to why the Russo brothers didn't play the Immigrant Song during Thor's arrival. Especially when I would guess most the audience had it already queued up in their heads. Endgame is packed to the brim with fan callbacks and iconic moments. Thor, now keeping notes, remember to aim a bit higher this time when confronting Thanos at the beginning of the story. There's a definite lull in the action department after that. It's not until the time travel starts where the action ratchets back up. There's a return to the events of New York, where Steve Rogers confronts America's ass, aka himself. Loki gets to dabble in more hijinks and eventually spin himself into a Disney Plus show. Hawkeye and Natasha squabble for a bit, until it's made clear that Hawkeye is still the most useless Avenger. Guy can't even kill himself properly. The reason to return to Endgame is for the last stand. Rogers bloodied and bashed, standing alone on the front lines, hoping for a miracle. Then those glorious portals start to open and all hell breaks loose. Captain America and Thor are tag team fighting Thanos, hammers in hand. Tony and Pepper go back to back in a frenzy of laser beam attacks. Star-Lord and the gang are shooting and stabbing their way to victory, while Captain Marvel takes a break from whatever the script was pretending she was doing to fly through a bunch of ships and people. She even gets to join up with the other female heroes for a beautiful, emotionally impactful, definitely non-pandering moment to save Spider-Man. Sarcasm there. I think it would be foolish to say Infinity War wins in this department, just based on that final fight alone. 
So I'm gonna give it to Endgame here. The Avengers saga has been a roller coaster so far. I'm not convinced we will ever reach this peak again with the franchise, but I remain optimistic for the future. Fans have been waiting for these movies for a long time, and I can't imagine many were let down by what we got in the end. Sure, some of the characters could have been handled better, and perhaps the script fell into some really convenient trappings here and there. As the dust settles though, Avengers Infinity War and Endgame are easily rewatchable, highly entertaining movies that will be remembered for a very long time. There's no definitive winner here, but you can probably guess by this conversation how I'm leaning. Now it's your turn though, and that's what's most important. Leave a comment giving me your pick and why you made that decision. I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, thanks for watching. I'm Adam, and this is Real Rivalries. Thanks for watching. Let us know which movie you'd like to see rival next by commenting down below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that like button and comment with your episode winner. If you're into movie debates, make sure to subscribe to Screen Rant for more real rivalries and much, much more.